Despite Diana's recent decision to speak out on primetime television, she remains under siege by the press. What effect is all this pressure having on her private life? She lives a very quiet life at Kensington Palace these days. Very few visitors. She is often in bed alone at 8 o'clock at night. During the 1980s, what she calls the Dark Ages, Diana, she attempted various half-hearted suicide attempts. She had bulimia nervosa, the uh, uh, eating disorder. Now, she's come to terms with all that now. Her life is on a subdued, uh, even keel. She's taking various medications to control the eating disorder, the bulimia. Confidently stepping out on her own now, Diana, royal ambassador at large, is welcomed in Japan by the emperor. Diana is still as important as ever to the royal family. There's something about her, some sort of magic, that nobody else has got, and that's both a problem and a pleasure. It's a pleasure for us, but it's a problem perhaps for the royal family because they need her. They need somebody as high profile as that. She's good news. Marrying into the royal family with all its history and tradition is not an easy step to take, particularly for a commoner. There is not one significant marriage which has survived the royal family. Princess Margaret's marriage ended in divorce. Princess Anne's ended in divorce. Duke and Duchess of York, Prince and Princess of Wales, they're in separation. So there's something about the royal family and the way that they behave towards outsiders, which is very questionable. At the same time, it's very difficult for an outsider to cope with life in the goldfish bowl of Buckingham Palace. On this occasion, the goldfish bowl is the choppy waters of the Venice Lagoon. Public interest in a private visit by Diana was so intense that a local TV station followed her everywhere for 48 hours, never letting her whereabouts and her latest change of clothing go unnoticed by a curious Italian public. Britain's most popular export was in town. They all surrendered to her as if she had been laying it under siege in a medieval um, way. She just walked in there and every man wanted to kiss her hand and she was queen of that of that wonderful city for the two days that she was there. Married to Charles and with no divorce imminent, Diana could still become queen. But by exposing her unhappy marriage, she signaled that she wanted to change her royal role, although remaining one of its major players. Now she plays the part her way. In need of constant reassurance, Diana uses her sexuality and beauty to signal that she still needs the trappings of royalty. I think that she does give a feeling of self-assurance. I'm not absolutely sure that it's genuine. I don't know that she actually feels it because she is not a secure person. She was never brought up to be a secure person, but she's been given the trappings of security in adult life, and she's taken to these trappings and they feel comfortable on her. And she sees herself very much now as someone who is admired and looked up to. She sees herself as uh, an icon. And because she can look at herself in this way, yes, she feels much less fragile, much stronger, and much more capable, in my view, of playing the role that one day she may have to play. A flirt by nature, Diana is in no doubt about what the soldiers and the press have really come to see. Even with the army a few weeks ago, when she was sort of walking across the parade ground at her regiment down in Canterbury, and she had on a very tight skirt, and her, she was wiggling her bottom as she walked across the parade ground with all the soldiers. I mean, it, I'm sure there's a little bit of sort of, look at me, how lovely I am, you know, and, and she does look lovely. She's quite brave to show it now. She's not frightened or unconfident to sort of say, you know, this is how I look. How you can read Diana's moods in her clothes. Her clothes are transparent. I know where she's coming from when I see what she's wearing. 
Of course, we all remember that in the sad days when her marriage was going wrong, those gloomy things she wore, remember when she burst into tears, feeling blue she was in a very dull blue dress, sort of gathered in round her waist with a skirt hanging down to her calves. And when she's feeling in the pink, that's what she wears, a nice, short, sassy pink suit, and she looks terrific. It echoes absolutely her mood, like almost nobody else I know, even the Hollywood stars. When she went to New York to that fashion party with Liz Tilberis, who was a fashion editor, she wore that dress that showed her muscly back and she had that wet look hairdo that was very much a fashion look of the moment. It was a look that shrieked 1995 and it always will. I think the great thing is that uh, she can go to America and she can be treated um, like the goddess that she really thinks herself to be in lots of ways. She is a Hollywood star while she's over there. There is no complaint about uh, the way she dresses, there's no complaint about what she says or does or anything else like that. They are, the Americans are hugely uncritical. They adore Diana, they adore the idea of Diana, and they want to have her um, living there permanently. And so she goes there, she mixes with very rich people, and uh, they treat her as uh, one of um, their own, and she has a wonderful time. And I think that in due course we'll see Diana spending more and more time in America. Diana's clothes and fashion sense have moved on since the power dressing days a few years ago, when she was constantly in the royal spotlight. Diana was a fashion icon in the 1980s because the style she adopted corresponded exactly with that dynasty Dallas look that everybody aspired to. It was her moment. We saw her, we fashion editors, really change like a chameleon into dynasty dye, a sort of sub Joan Collins look. In one way, the Queen and Diana have something in common. Just as the Queen found her favourite designers and worked with them, Hardy Amis, Norman Hartnell in the early days, Ian Thomas. In the same way, Diana has found her faithful few and stuck to them, especially Catherine Walker, who really has made an enormous number of her clothes. It's funny how Diana still doesn't seem to feel quite free to go out and buy designer clothes that she obviously would love. I mean, we hear these stories that she slipped in and bought a Versace shirt or that she's got an Armani jacket, but she doesn't really go for a designer look. But she does go for that image and get Catherine Walker to make something perhaps slightly toned down in that image. At the same time, she's also dressing now in the 90s to be a working woman. She does a lot of work. She's a person in her own right. Because, you know, with Diana, it starts with the body. She's really built her body to be a different size and shape from how it was when she first came into the family. At times, Kensington Palace is almost a temple, a shrine to the body. Every morning, she's up at seven, she goes off to the gym, she works out. Um, she has, uh, she goes for colonic irrigation, she goes for aromatherapy, she goes for massage, she sees a doctor twice a week who gives her various medications, various vitamin pills and so on. So she spends an awful lot of time pampering Diana. In fact, she calls days when she goes for aromatherapy and other such treatments, pamper Diana days. But that's echoing a state of mind. She's taking an American view now. I am what I am. I'm my own woman. I can be sexy. I can be myself. I am confident. Personally, I think sometimes it tries a little bit too hard in the way that American women can do. But Diana is still in her 30s looking great. How does Diana view the monarchy? Diana believes that the monarchy should be more informal, more streamlined. Uh, more uh, hands-on and, and less remote. She's never like the razzmatazz of royalty. She hated Ascot. She found garden parties a bore. She goes to Sandringham for Christmas Day, uh, just for a few hours, and then that's un very much under sufferance. She doesn't go to Balmoral. She doesn't go to the church service at Windsor at Easter. She actually keeps out of their hair, and she feels a lot better for it. And at the same time, she's very aware of the cost 
of monarchy. She feels she's she's very sensitive to people's accusations that the monarchy is a spendthrift institution, which uh, which just has endless numbers of hangers-on. So therefore, she will go on scheduled flights. She will go on uh, a normal train. Uh, and also, it's a nice counterpoint to the way that the rest of the royal family, especially Prince Charles, behaves uh, with his using the royal train almost like a personal fiefdom. Life in the royal goldfish bowl was just too much for one newcomer to the royal family. Sarah Ferguson, another commoner, married Prince Andrew and became Duchess of York. Fergie certainly brought a vitality and zest to her royal duties. Eager to make contact, she launched into the crowds. But it was her down-to-earth, hearty manner which was to be her downfall. The Fergie factor was a force for change. Sarah's dress sense came in for a lot of public attention. Princess of Wales was a hard act to follow. Stoically, Sarah maintained a highly personal style. The Duchess of York lets it all hang out, doesn't she? She wants to wear things that are fun for her, and sometimes it's a hit, occasionally it's a hit, and very often it's a miss. I see the thinking behind it. She goes to the sweet pea ball, and she thinks that she'll look like a sweet pea if she wears a dress that's blue and mauve and she's carrying a mauve bag. But, you know, it's very difficult to look like a bunch of sweet peas, especially when you've got red hair. She really looks at her best when she's casual and when she's wearing country clothes. And it's funny how Sarah knocks spots off Diana in that country look. Unfairly lampooned by the press, Sarah was never one to stand on ceremony. She supports her charities in a practical and business-like way with a natural compassion for life's victims. And, uh, get German sponsors and uh, the firms from Poland. And, um, and um, how old is Kasia now? Yeah, we are, we are Kasia Malat. She will, she will be six years in December. She will be six in December. She's exactly the same age as Beatrice then, right? Oh, my gosh, hold on a minute. <laughs> It's for 18,000... Sarah's lack of regard for a cool, stuffy royal performance left her wide open to criticism, even within royal circles. The Duchess of York has no future in the royal family, and in fact, uh, she de demonstrates that by just doing most of her activities outside Britain. She knows that she's reviled by the public, and she's disliked by the courtiers, uh, and barely tolerated by the rest of the royal family. Sarah's £5 million mansion, a wedding gift from the Queen, is now empty most of the time. Andrew is away at sea and Sarah lives extravagantly in rented accommodation nearby. Fergie spends money like water. She spends uh, £1,000 a week on her house. She spends nearly £1,000 a week on her clothes. She has a staff of six. She has cars. She has expensive holidays. She likes to go away at least six or seven times a year. No matter how much money Fergie had, she would spend it and still be in debt. So, you know, what's hard up? I mean, <laughs> she's richer than we are. She's very extravagant and very generous. Fergie loves to give presents and she loves people to... She loves to be surrounded by pretty things. It's part of her character. I mean, if something goes wrong with you, you know, there, or something... Un I think something awful happened to me not very long ago, and suddenly there's this most wonderful bunch of flowers, and it's, it's from Duchess of York. Very sweet. And it's a kind of extravagance, which, which, is, which is just part of her makeup. Yeah, she's a spendthrift. The royal wives of Windsor married their Prince Charmings to discover that it brought loneliness and despair. But it did have some compensations. They are in their ivory towers. They are surrounded by paparazzi photographers. Uh, they feel that their lives are no longer their own. At the same time, they are living an extremely luxurious lifestyle and having a marvellous time. At ease in the company of other famous celebrities, Diana is secure in the knowledge that she is still the wife of one of the world's richest men, whose birthright is a huge income from the Duchy of Cornwall. Well, there's the famous Duchy of Cornwall American Express card, which Diana still has in her pocket, uh, and be I believe uses relatively freely. I don't think, like some ex-wives or estranged wives, she 
punishes her husband by going berserk with it along Knightsbridge and uh, Harvey Nichols, etc. But it's certainly there to finance the clothes that she needs. She can argue she needs them for official purposes, uh, plus jewellery, etc. He's moaned in the past about Diana spending, I think it was 160,000 a year on makeup, etc. Of course, those figures are exaggerated and plucked out of thin air. But um, again, the British people would wish to see Diana kept in the style to which she's accustomed, and they might think that's a very good way of spending the Duchy of Cornwall's money, rather than spending the same amount on maintaining polo ponies for Prince Charles. Diana's jewels, too, are worth a fortune. did receive as presents from the Queen emeralds, an emerald choker that had belonged to Queen Mary, rather Art Deco in style. And Prince Charles bought her an Art Deco emerald and diamond bracelet to go with it. Like so much he didn't know about his young wife, he didn't know she didn't like emeralds. The Queen also gave Diana the lover's knot tiara. But you notice that Diana wears much more the Spencer family of tiara. In fact, she hardly wears tiaras now, in, since she has been separated from the royal family and from Prince Charles. But the Spencer tiara seemed more in her style, and that she's worn that quite a lot. I often think about the wisdom of the Queen as a mother and a grandmother and a head of the family. It always puzzled me that Diana wasn't given more royal jewels. And certainly Sarah, the Duchess of York, got nothing. I mean, she got a piece that were bought at Garrard's. I think she didn't give them because she suspected right from the start, maybe, that these marriages were going to be difficult and the jewels perhaps were held back to be given for 10th wedding anniversaries or 20th or 25th wedding anniversaries and those girls haven't reached them, have they? And I don't think they'll be getting the jewels. Initially attracted to Sarah because of her lack of reverence towards him, Andrew delighted in her no-nonsense attitude to life. But from the start, their marriage was a fiery one, with Andrew ill-prepared for what was in store. Anybody who married Sarah was ill-prepared for it. Uh, she was a hot potato, that woman. She really was. I, don't, I think Andrew wanted somebody more calm, gentle, not a, a sort of tornado like Sarah Ferguson. I, think he was, I didn't, don't think he knew what he was getting himself into. With little support from the royal family and with Andrew away at sea, Sarah found the long periods at home alone unbearable. Holiday photographs featuring Texan oil millionaire Steve Wyatt with Princess Beatrice confirmed gossip that her marriage was on the rocks. Further allegations about her relationship with another Texan, Johnny Bryan, shook the royal family when secretly taken photographs of them together on holiday in the south of France appeared. Johnny Bryan defended his position, but it was soon clear that he and Sarah were lovers. I think she has always needed um, the presence of a powerful male figure in her life. For a long time, that was her father. And it has been replaced by a string of men who tended to be older and manipulative. I think probably Fergie's always needed more mental and phys physical support. She responds. To, to love, and I don't think she's had very much of it. I think she's been quite badly treated throughout her life by men, and, and I just think she doesn't, I don't think she trusts people. Uh, and I think she's, you know, she's got two sides of her. One side is this sort of really exuberant, ebullient, fun person that you'd love to have at your dinner party. And she really is a good girl. And there's this other side, is this confused, lost, an unhappy and an un insecure and uncertain person. And they're sort of, these two people are battling with each other and sometimes it all goes very wrong. The estranged couple get together regularly in an effort to give their children a stable upbringing. I think Prince Andrew considers that Fergie is his wife. She's the mother of his children. And as long as she's happy, he, he seems to go along with it. He loves her very much. He really did or does cherish the hope that one day they'll be together again. 
people say that he would have her back if she wanted to, but she doesn't. She doesn't want to get involved in the royal family again. She feels very hurt and wounded by the treatment that she had from the courtiers and also the, the lack of support that she's had from other members of the royal family. In recent months, Sarah has tried to dissociate herself from Johnny Bryan, following bad publicity about his business activities abroad. The difficulty with John Bryan is that he is American, he is not tied into our royal family or the way that we perceive our royal family. And sooner or later, if the relationship fails, we can see him in America selling his story. And it's not just the story about him and the Duchess of York. He knows about the relationship with, between the Prince of Wales and the Princess of Wales. He knows about the Queen, he knows about Prince Philip, he knows everything. And if he decided to tell his story, that is the most extraordinary time bomb. Fergie and John Bryan have entered into some kind of devil's contract, which neither of them can get out of. Uh, but if it continues in the way that it has been going on, could ultimately bring down the House of Windsor, because sooner or later, Fergie will have to distance herself from John Bryan. His, his business activities uh, do not bear close scrutiny, uh, and he has um, he created enemies wherever he has gone. He's a bully. He's a, a, an uncomfortable figure to be around. Um, but basically, he knows where the bodies are buried. The siege of Diana continues. Public property number one, her private life is always fair game for a prying press. Diana knows that there are photographers waiting like vultures to take a picture of her with the new man in her life. Of course, there have been all kinds of names. There've been, there's been the art dealer, Oliver Hall. There's been James Hewitt, of course, the riding instructor, who uh, did rather more than instruct us to ride. There's been James Gilby, the alleged voice on the squidgy tapes. There's been her bodyguard, Barry Manneke, a man who tragically died in a car accident. In a way, when you look at Diana's love life, it's always been, it's been one of betrayal. Betrayal by Prince Charles, betrayal by Hewitt. And I think that Diana herself is very reluctant to get back onto the merry-go-round of romance, at least for the time being. Diana and Sarah were a new breed, young, independent, and unwilling to bow to a system they considered stuffy and outdated. But the experiment failed. I think what people forget is that Diana has voluntarily given up being Queen of England. The plain fact is that if anything were to happen to the Queen tomorrow, Charles would become king and Diana would become queen consort. That is the law. So what worries politicians at the moment is the fact that if we're anything were to happen to the queen tomorrow, you've got the ugly prospect of the king divorcing the queen before his coronation and denying her any role in his coronation, which would be immensely unpopular due to monarchy, yet more possibly terminal damage. So that's why the politicians are anxious for the divorce to happen sooner rather than later. The problem for, for the Princess of Wales is that she is still, whatever else may happen to her, the mother of the future king. And so she has a responsibility, an enduring responsibility, to the monarchy. I'm afraid I'm one of those people who believes that she should actually pack her bags and make a new start. The longer she stays lingering at Kensington Palace, a place she calls an open prison, then the worse it is for her mentally and spiritually.